morning and welcome. And just a note here that we'll be starting in just a few moments uh, when we get organized here. And uh, happy to see all of you here this morning on this beautiful morning. And always good to see you in this room. And uh, I think we're probably already uh, uh, at the point where we can begin with a word of prayer. Lord, once again, you call us together. Thank you. Uh, let us never take this for granted. There are certainly places in the world where it would be dangerous even to meet in your holy name. So, Lord, thank you that we can be here and open our hearts to hear your word for us today, that we may learn something of what it is to be your people, to follow you faithfully, to hear your word, to absorb it, and to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. And I mentioned people in the world where life is not easy because in many ways that's a kind of a theme for today, but let me uh, lead into it in a little different way as we begin chapter 8. We'll be on 8 today. Next time we'll probably be doing 9 and 10. 9 has only 15 verses uh, and we'll probably finish, uh, as I think I said last week, by the end of August. So we'll be doing uh, this session and, and three more. And this wonderful book, I hope you've really felt as, as I have uh, in going over 2 Corinthians particularly, how passionate a person Paul was, how loving a person, how caring a person he was, where it wasn't simply a matter of going around and impersonally speaking the gospel. He really cared for people, and that's very much at the heart of the lesson today. He cared for the people in Corinth. He wants to see them grow in Christ. He wants to see them mature. At the same time, he also cared deeply for Christians far away, even those who were in Jerusalem. Christians where he had once been, well, the Christians he had once attempted to persecute even. So there's something very personal about this today. Our theme today uh, is, is essentially, I think, even though we don't normally probably think of the chapter this way, Paul's deep concern to call us to love those Christians even who are at some distance from us. Not only those delightful people we see uh, most Sundays, but those at, at some length. Paul is saying, I really want you to be aware of the needs of Christians, not just around us, but even those hundreds of miles away in Jerusalem, particularly because he's going to be talking here ultimately about coming to the aid of those Christians in Jerusalem who were really under the gun. They were being persecuted. A lot of them had, uh, had uh, lost a lot of income, they were impoverished, and Paul is speaking to people hundreds of miles away, and we've got the Jew versus Gentile gap here, which was so huge in the ancient world, and Paul is saying, I want you to care about those people who are distant from you because of what Jesus Christ has done. Matter of fact, a, a little intro here, maybe of a few minutes, and then I'm going to actually call on Pastor Dan for something here, because I've got some pictures of something that this church was involved in about 10 years ago that I think will pick up on this theme today. So I don't simply want to talk about a quote-unquote collection, uh, an offering years and years and years and years ago for a certain group of people, but to see that as a wonderful example and call for us to sense the deep, rich, and broad fellowship that God is calling us to in Christ. And this is really what Paul is talking about, even though he never mentions the word in this immediate context I just told you about, collection or money or anything. Again, because he's really talking about <clears throat> this broader concern that we have, uh, a deep love and concern for Christians far from us. And so he begins by saying, and if this is the only verse we had, you wouldn't have any idea that this had to do with reaching out with love and, and money, uh, to Christians far away, because look at this, this first verse. Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace. Well, he talks about grace all the time, doesn't he? The grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Well, you would, again, have no idea specifically what he's talking about. I want to emphasize something I've tried to talk about uh, several times in recent weeks, that I think in our time particularly, the word grace gets used very cheaply. It doesn't have the richness of biblical meaning, or it doesn't have that sense of amazingness without which there really is no grace. Oh, grace, yeah, we live by grace. We don't live by law, so let people do whatever they want. I won't judge you. Don't you judge me and accept everybody, blah, 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 blah. That's very often what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called 
cheap grace. And he, of course, wrote at the time of, the, uh, of World War II and, and Hitler, cheap grace, talking a lot about grace, but not really living it, because grace really is a call to live. And we uh, read last week from Titus 2, and I remember, Pastor Dad, you mentioned this a long time ago in a sermon, and it really hit me that Sunday, Titus 2, 11 to 12, that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Wait a minute, I thought grace was just God's acceptance of us at the cross. No, there's a power in grace that really calls upon us to live different lives. It's so easy to sing about grace, but rather superficially, like this crazy little church that I heard about. Somebody sent me this slide, I can't remember where I got. This is almost grace, but it's a little different in this case. You'll see what I mean when I put something on the screen here. It's actually amazing Greece, not the country Greece, G-R-E-A-S-E. -E. Well, what in the world are we talking about? We've got this uh, strange church here where they're singing <laughs> amazing Greece. <laughs> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, and then, oi, hallelujah. <laughs> I, 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 again, I don't remember where I got that. The only thing I could figure out, it must have something to do with the uh, Church of Seventh-day Adventists. That's the only thing I could, I could, it's getting bad. Forgive my puns. I, even Punsters Anonymous gave up on me a long time ago, so I a, I'm a sucker for that. But this, this great, you know, the best example, and it actually refers to our church right here. Years ago, and I, I write these things down, I wouldn't remember that it was the year 2010 or so, but we had, uh, and Pastor Dan will remember, Pastor Keith Precker, who at that time was at Erie, Rejoice Lutheran, I think is the name of it, in, in Erie, and he came uh, for Stewardship Sunday or Consecration Sunday or whatever we called it, and gave, I thought, a marvelous example of grace as ultimately empowering us. So hang in there. I think we can all identify in one way or another with the example he gave that, again, I thought was so powerful. And Keith was telling about the time that he was a teenager, had just basically begun to drive. He had the family car, but he had no interest in following his dad's harangues about, this is how you drive, and be careful about this, son, and be defensive here. You know, none of that. He just went out, and by his own admission, I'm just going by what he said publicly, you know, was just a, about as reckless as he wanted to be, which was okay until he got into an accident with the family car and had to call his father and tell him. And he said he was just trembling as he waited for his father to come out there. He could only imagine what his dad was going to tell him in terms of, I told you so. I but he said the father literally embraced him with an embrace of love and forgiveness. And Keith said at that time, he said, I really began to understand what grace that I'd heard about in church really means. And then going along with our point today, he said, it's at that time that I realized I want to drive the way my father wants me to drive. Not just because he's commanding me, you know, I resisted the command, but I really do want to shape up and make him proud of me as a driver. Again, I think with slight changes, many of us in our lives can think of something like that. Well, think of the empoweringness of it, where when it hit him, he realized life needed to change. And grace, as Paul uses it, I'm going to point out a couple of words in English here that you'd never guess were just basically the Greek words for grace. We'll, we'll do that as we hit it verse by verse. You're going to see that grace is far deeper than, again, and I mentioned this at some length because of, uh, of some of the false stuff or the very superficial stuff going around in Christianity today, which really, again, does cheapen the idea of grace. Grace is a powerful thing. I mean, it was C.S. Lewis said that's what makes Christianity distinct from all other religions. Grace, and of course, all centered in Christ. That's the real distinction, but, but grace... And so Paul says, I want you to know about the grace, and he's really talking about giving or generosity, which again, here in the Greek is simply, charis is the word, you know, charismatic means uh, uh, having to do with grace or charisma, spiritual gift, and so forth. So it's just that gift, charis, that appear, or that word, that appears in interesting places in this particular chapter today. A quick map here, and then I'm going to get to this incident that involves uh, faith community. 
he's talking uh, about the Macedonian churches, and I, I think it's important for us to know just some very simple but basic geography. The northern part of Greece there is Macedonia, and uh, in the New Testament, the really prominent cities are Philippi and Thessalonica, and Berea is also mentioned in the book of Acts. Paul is writing this from probably Thessalonica, writing this from someplace in Macedonia, and you see where Corinth is there. It's down in another section of Greece called Achaia, which is south central Greece. And uh, he is telling them that these folks in Macedonia, where he's writing, have given what he's really going to go on to say, uh, well, right here in, in the very next verse, out of their most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. They were really impoverished. They could have said, hey, we've got to take care of our own people. We're really in trouble here. There were a lot of reasons. They were being persecuted to some extent. Uh, the Roman rule wasn't always as benign as, as we might think it's certain. I mean, I say that. A lot of people don't have the image of benign Roman rule, but I've also heard historians say this was the greatest time in history to be living under the Roman Empire. Well, fact is, Macedonia and many places, if you lived in a city, tended to have certain problems from, as I read a historian just the other day, from high taxes, high rent, high food prices. We, of course, have no idea what any of that was, but, <laughs> but they were really hurting, and yet they gave. And here's what I want to talk about, and I want to do this well. Pastor Dan is here, so I'm going to jump over a couple of other slides. But the idea that uh, Christians even though these Macedonian Christians were really hurting, they wanted to show their, there's a Greek word for fellowship. I, I don't suggest that you memorize many Greek words, but, but one that might work if you're going to pick the top half dozen would be koinonia, because it's a word for communion or fellowship, but far deeper than we normally uh, would interpret it as being. You know, it has to do with a deep sharing, a deep relationship because of Christ. For Jewish Christians, hundreds of miles away, they've never met, they'll never meet them, a very different style of life, Gentile versus Jew, and again, I can't strongly enough emphasize that dichotomy in the ancient world. One of the ancient theologians, I think it was Tertullian, had the statement, uh, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? I mean, there's such different outlooks on life expressed there, such different civilizations, but guess what? The folks who were under Athens, so to speak, that Greek culture, were really concerned about their Jewish believers, their brothers and sisters in Christ, miles and miles and miles away. I'm going to, again, to, I'm going to jump ahead, and I've got to even skip over a couple of slides that will flash on briefly here, and I'll come back to them. But, uh, but I know Pastor Dan has to be in eventually for the second part of the the service here that's going on, and I am so pleased, first of all, I was going to say this anyway, I'm always so pleased that such a good percentage of our income here, right off the top, goes, the income in terms of our giving, goes beyond our own immediate needs and desires and reaches out, and I'm just more, more convicted than ever as I read this chapter today how very important that is in the Christian life. And one of the things that has been a, a wonderful tradition in this church is that at certain milestones, there's a giving away, uh, quite literally giving away uh, you know, money, a, a monetary gift, to others who are in need. And I was reminded, and again, I made some notes on this or I wouldn't have remembered all the details, but I knew that on our 30th anniversary, around whatever it was, 2009, 2010, uh, that uh, something like $30,000 was given and it was given to a new ministry uh, to the Oromo community in, uh, and that's uh, one of the Ethiopian branches, in, in uh, Denver. And this was at the time when there were uh, a fledgling group of Christians there who, who had also made a, a real strong stance biblically. This was about the time things were really getting shaken up in the, in the Lutheran church. And uh, there was a need uh, for uh, uh, outreach to folks in that Denver area and so I remember one night, and here's where I'm going to jump ahead, even a couple of the, as I said, pass over a couple of slides here. Here we go. Uh, whoops, get the first one here. This was actually held at a Presbyterian church, and I wouldn't have remembered this, but Corona Presbyterian Church at 8th and Downing in, in Denver, and that was the worship leader. And again, Pastor Dan, we had several people, I think, from the, the church there, as I recall, and you will, or most of you in this room will remember Pastor Gadetta Burka, Dr. Gemetrius Buber, rather, 
uh, the, the pastor who was being installed there is Cadet Taborka. This is Gemetius Buba. Dr. Buba spoke here last November, wasn't it, where he preached right here? A tremendous preacher, wonderful guy, and he was speaking. He's got some connection. Did he have some relatives there, maybe parents or somebody at that? Okay. Well, that maybe may explains because I, I was going to mention on top of that, and, and, and I say on top of that, it was a wonderful and inspiring evening, but as I was going to tell all of you, uh, a real key to that whole evening was the appearance of Dan the Baptist right there. <laughs> <laughs> so what was this, and uh, uh, we began to talk about this, but was this, uh, were these family members to some extent, do you so, think? Or? So, yeah, I think <laughs> well, 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 you're in another one, actually. You got, I've got one more picture of that. And uh, you're there. Uh, this is, this is Gadetta Burka uh, for the installation. And so because of the $30,000 that we were able to give as a congregation here, once again, uh, as uh, uh, an outgrowth of our 30th anniversary of this church, uh, it was wonderful because they were able to call this fine young Pastor uh, Gadetta Burka. And you can see those who so, were. Yeah, both go to Gadet is there on the right, and then David Hunt uh, Mentor is in the, in the middle. Uh, yeah. This is the Bishop of the Hale, North American Lutheran Church. Yeah. Yeah, both, both Pastor Wendell and, and Dr. Buba were, uh, and, and still are, uh, on the matter of fact, about the only remaining ones uh, yeah. uh, that the church was founded in, it was voted into existence in 2010. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, they're still there after, after that many years. The bishop is no longer uh, still the same bishop. Yeah, but anyway. Joy here of baptizing uh, two or three. Well, that's what I was confusing then, maybe, Dan, because I thought you. Yeah, what, 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 when, when was that that you baptized then? That, that was about seven years ago. Okay. After, I think it was the summer of uh, 2014. So that's eight years ago. Okay. Yeah. And who was that you're just referring to? Yeah, that's okay. When Gadetta was here, yes, okay. That. Okay, that makes sense because I remember when Gadetta was here, and of course, as I say, just last November, I think if you were here, you would not forget the wonderful message from Dr. Buba. So we got. We had three services that day, and we gave three different messages. Wow. Wow. Oh my. Oh, he, he's he's no he's. He's terrific. We always, uh, uh, in the early days, I, I would go to the convocations pretty frequently, I mean, every year for a while, and uh, we all just uh, so much enjoyed it when he was able to speak. Again, the idea that uh, there was a, an outreach here where I think, you know, the, and certainly the folks who went down there that night, you know, were all very touched by that and moved by that, and I'm so glad we could do this. Oh, absolutely. Wow. So great story. So then we decided, I think we're on the 10th or 15th anniversary, so give me 15, 15. So on the 15th, gave away. So in addition to our first group, this is this is in addition to that. Yeah. We gave away 15,000 on our 50th anniversary, oh. 20 on our 20th, 25 on our 25th, wow. 30 on our for the uh, Romo Eastern Group. Then on our 35th, we raised, we, we gave the congregation, it's actually a little bit different than the outreach we did, we gave the congregation, we gave everybody in the congregation. $35 there to invest in some ministry and then to report back. And so the stories we got back of people who invested their $35 who had been just been marveled at the Lord. Well, uh, amazing, God multiplied. Amazing the, the different uh, destinations that people took. Ah. Yeah. Uh. So it is. Now here's a remarkable thing too. On our 40th anniversary, COVID hit. So we really kind of got robbed of, of, of officially celebrating our 40th anniversary as we had intended, as we planned, and as we wanted to. However, this is how God works for, for good and all things and miracles. We end up raising through the first responders fund and the pandemic relief fund and the wildfire fund close to $70,000. So really, when we would have maybe liked to have given away $40,000, we ended up raising $70,000, almost double. So I mean, again, examples of God multiplying the loaves and the fish. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. And, and we can't change. Right. It was, it was to be supported by the Sent church to Louisville. Right. There's a pastor in the house in Vernon Hills. They were, mm. they were a visiting with us. They were meeting for at least a period of time in the ballroom of a hotel. Wow. Uh, and so there we were on Sunday for a while and then scattered all over for other kinds of things. And so our uh, $40,000 <laughs> and now we will receive our offering. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's wonderful. I mean, you guys have given such great examples here of, of what I was trying to get at, and, and I think we'll see in terms of what St. Paul was doing. The, the, the wonderful sense of, uh, I mean, I, I just am thrilled to hear what, what you two have both said there, and the wonderful record of this church over the years. There's something that, as they say, you know, kind of keeps on giving when you give. Uh, there is that sense that, uh, you know, we, we can rejoice at that and rejoice in, in God's grace, because again, this is connected to, to grace here to this day. So, boy, thank you both for that. That, that is great. I mean, it, re, this church is really, yeah, go ahead, Rich. Now I want to put in a shameless plug for the endowment fund. Okay, <laughs> see, I knew it was coming in one form or another here at the... Please remember the endowment funds in your estates as you prepare your wills. Hmm. We have done that ourselves. So, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, a shameless plug, and I turned the floor back. To no, that's that's great. I I just I, again really. Oh boy, now am I uh, am I stuck here? Okay, Let's see if I can get back. I'm pounding this, and not much is happening. Keep pounding. There we go. Oops. <laughs> oh. I wanted to. I wanted to see my 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 nomination for the most interesting church name that I run across in life. I was going to say what Paul was talking about uh, in the Thessalonian situation, where it says they gave even beyond their ability. They gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. It was no halfway stuff. By the way, you wonder how would a church ever get named? There, there probably should be a lot of halfway Lutheran churches if the truth <laughs> if the truth be known. But no, the honest, uh, oh, I forgot that I had it written here. Oh, I, I forgot that showed up, uh, that uh, it was located halfway. There are little towns, and I looked this up on the map. It's about uh, 20, 30 miles uh, n northeast, or basically north of Springfield, Missouri. And there are these two little towns, but I think one of them has a Baptist school, which is probably why this church was able to, to function. Uh, Bolivar and Buffalo, Missouri. And exactly halfway, there's a town so small, I've got a, a very good... Atlas of the United States, and I couldn't even find the name of halfway on that town, but it actually is located halfway between, I think Boulevard is something like 8,000 people in Buffalo, 2,000 something, and then there's this little tiny dot for halfway. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I tried to use that as an example of, uh, of, uh, <laughs> uh, of what uh, these Thessalonian Christians were not. They were not halfway folks. Think of this, they gave beyond their ability, entirely on their own. In other words, I didn't have to beg them. Look at this. They urgently pleaded with us. Now, these are Christians under fire. Maybe, maybe not terrible physical persecution, but they were definitely discriminated against. But urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. And that word privilege, here we go, folks, is grace. Charis that I told you about. It's basically saying they pleaded with us for the grace 
of sharing, koinonia, that word that can mean everything from communing at the communion table, you know, all the way to a relatively informal fellowship. But the privilege of sharing in this service, diakonia, I've mentioned many times related to our word deacon, to the saints, just the name for Christians, set apart ones, different from the world. The Jews uh, who were Christians in Jerusalem were very different from the world around them. The Gentiles in Corinth and in Thessalonica who became Christians were very different from the world around them. That's what the word saint ultimately means. Same as the word holy. Holy ones is a synonym for that. And it means set apart ones. And they did not do merely as we expected. You know, we had a certain expectation. Okay, they're going to give a little bit. No, they gave themselves. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. The two always go together. You know, this idea that, well, you know, God, I believe in God, but I don't need the church. No, their giving themselves to the Lord went hand in hand with giving themselves to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus. Okay, Titus is kind of his uh, messenger to Corinth. Since he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this, and it doesn't say act of grace. My, my version here does. It's not in the Greek. It's simply bring to completion this grace. And I'm mentioning this several times just to, again, warn you against the very cheap uses of the word grace in our time. I urge you to complete this grace. If grace doesn't change our lives, as it, it changed Pastor Precker's driving life anyway, when he saw how his father loved him even when he had totally messed up, that was a power for new life, to obey his father from that point on. As I say, a great example, and so down to earth. That's what grace does. Otherwise, it's not amazing grace at all. But just as you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, big items at, at Corinth, in complete earnestness and, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, because this is grace, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. That's kind of a, you know, it's hard to put it this exactly. Paul is saying, no, I'm not saying you've got to do this, but he doesn't mind using the example of these Thessalonian Christians who are also, uh, especially, as a matter of fact, Corinth was rich compared to Thessalonica. A, a quick story, can't resist a group of Americans, largely of Chinese origin, were going over to China, did go over to China, visited primarily Nanjing, and most of them were Christians, and on Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, they went to various churches, and one woman, Mrs. Chong, uh, chose to go uh, outside of the city some distance to a very f poor Chinese community of farmers. And when they got there, the pastor asked if she would bring a, 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 a greeting from the United States or what have you, and she told uh, uh, in very warm terms uh, how glad she was to be there, but she told about her congregation in Los Angeles that was uh, really growing and the word of Jesus was really flourishing and they needed to build an addition. And then she gave her blessing to this particular congregation and sat down for the rest of the service. There were, there were several hundred people there, but it was obviously a very poor area. Something happened behind the scenes before the service was over and before they dismissed with the benediction, the, the pastor stood up and called Mrs. Chong to come forward once again. And so she came up to the front of this church again, a very dilapidated building in a very impoverished area. And, and he said, Mrs. Chong, we were many, he must have been talking to people somehow at certain points in the service, maybe during hymns or something, but said, you know, we were so impressed by your church needing to grow in that part of the United States that we want to give our offering, not just a portion of it, our offering this morning to you to take back to your church in the United States. Out of several hundred people who gave generously, it was all of about $140 in American money. I mean, that's how poor they were, because as we'll see here, the proportionate giving is what counts. The widow gave a lot. The widow's might was a lot, even though it was nothing in terms of dollars and cents. But Mrs. Chong, we want you to have this. Again, an example across the ocean of people realizing these are fellow Christians. We want to encourage them. We love them. So Paul does talk about comparing it with the earnestness of others, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. What about being poor? The incarnation, of course. Christ humbled himself, and, and uh, Philippi, uh, Philippians uh, 1, uh, uh, 2 rather, verses 5 through 8, you know, uh, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That is, didn't hang on to saying, well, I'm, I'm God, so I don't certainly, certainly don't need to suffer. No, he gave it all up. He gave. I mean, grace itself is giving because it wasn't cheap. God gave his only son. Think of the passion of Christ and all he went through. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. He's saying to the Corinthians, now last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. He's kind of encouraging them. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. And that's what he's saying in this eighth chapter. You, know, you, you did have a very good beginning, but remember they ran into some problems. There was the painful visit that Paul had to make and then the painful letter that Titus had brought them. And then remember they kind of got reconciled, we talked about in the last couple of chapters, after a lot of criticism of Paul. He's now feeling really good about them. So the thing to be done is to complete this gift. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one doesn't have. In other words, God doesn't expect us to give what we don't have. Give what he has given, of what he has given to us, a proportionate giving. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there may be uh, equality, which kind of means a mutuality here, I think. Basically, more of a caring. He's not saying we want every church's income to be exactly the same, and you know, it's nothing at all like socialism. But the idea that we want that back-and-forth giving one to the other. At the present time, your plenty will supply, because right now you're in good shape. Maybe someday, Corinthians, you're going to need maybe some help from Jerusalem Christians. Who knows? Things might get tough for you. At the present time, though, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. In other words, again, it's more of a mutuality of giving. As it is written, he who, this is quite a passage, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little, and he who drank much coffee <laughs> wanted even more, of course, and so that's why we have coffee breaks for all people equally. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go very rapidly, uh, probably record-breaking pace here, through the next several verses till the end of the chapter, because I want to close in kind of a different way uh, for, for several minutes, and I'll explain it at the time. Uh, I, a lot of this, you know, I don't think we have to worry too much about the details, but I'll try to pick up those points that uh, have continuing relevance where he says, I thank God, and by the way, the word for thank is related to grace. So grace is not only God's act of love to us, but the very thanksgiving that we give is related to that word grace. So I thank God who put it into the heart of Titus, the same concern Again, here's Paul's personal concern, the same concern I have for you. And it's a strong word in Greek. It means real eagerness, real desire to help. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, he's coming to you with much enthusiasm. And again, notice how Paul keeps stressing, and of his own initiative. These are not uh, uh, rigged camp, you know, stewardship campaigns where you try to get people to feel guilty or, hey, it's your duty. A real strong sense here that if you know the grace of God, I don't have to bang you over the head at all. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches. This would be somebody probably from Macedonia, one of the members there. We'll explain why in a moment. Who's praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering. You know, eventually Paul was to carry that offering to Jerusalem. He was so concerned, though, well, let's go on to the next verse and a half, and it'll explain it. Which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal, this, this generous gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In other words, he's going to every length he can so it's clear that this is not, is not an act of shystering here. He's not going to siphon off money. This is not some kind of grand scheme 
where he is going to make a play in Jerusalem to get more of a salary so he can go and be an evangelist. Nothing of that sort. I want to be above board. Sometimes it happens once in a while that highly respected charities do not pass the audit test, so to speak, and there's something going on behind the scenes. Paul is very practical here. Just in the eyes of men, I don't want to do anything that even looks phony. So if I'm the only one that's carrying the offering, people can say a lot of things. No, the brother is coming, and there's another one here in 22. In addition, we're sending with them our brother who has also proved to us in many ways that he is zealous. This is probably somebody then from uh, Corinth who's visiting there. And now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. Again and again, show your love. We are all, in certain respects, weak and frail human beings. There are always times in the lives of all of us when we really need help uh, to, <laughs> and that, that helping hand to, to lift us up there. Every one of us needs that from time to time. I want to close for about the last maybe five minutes here before a table talk in a very different way because I thought maybe this fits today. Some of you have heard me say that uh, there's an, or as a matter of fact, I know I've mentioned them more than once here. There's an organization called Open Doors, which is dedicated to the concern for persecuted Christians in our world today. And uh, I, I thought maybe this is an example. I've explained to some of you, I don't want to go into great detail in terms of my own routine. That's not the important thing. But I've, I've gotten in the habit, uh, and I think it's an important thing in, for me personally, I'm just talking, where before I even say grace, I have a, an earlier prayer time before breakfast, but before I even say grace at the breakfast table, I always pray a daily prayer for people who contribute to them. They send out a little monthly thing called, the, I like the title, the prayer force, the prayer force alert. And every day there's a brief request for prayer for somebody in our world, Christians or group of Christians, who are really under fire. And I thought, maybe this is the time. I, I've not going to detail. I've occasionally shown open doors map of, of the world's most difficult places to be a Christian, the countries with the greatest persecution. So some of you may vaguely recall that. I remember doing that here and even long ago in, in the other room where we used to meet for some reason. I remember showing and talking about that. But anyway, I thought, let me just take a sample month. I've got all kinds of materials from them, but rather than pick just the really outstanding, so to speak, the really striking cases, I'm just going to look at one month. This is July, so this is just the most recent month, just a very typical month, and they have this short thing of a couple of sentences every morning, and then the prayer request, which, I, which as I say, I, I pray before my own breakfast, Grace. But I want to give you some idea, because this is so much on my heart, again, with today's theme of being concerned for Christians that we'll probably never meet face to face. But I'm going to pick just eight or nine examples, and they're all short, and I'll close with it. But examples of things going on in our world today where we need in one way or another to be very concerned. Again, I appreciate so much the outreach concerns of this congregation. And here's an example of, of again, needs in, in our world as a whole. So I'm just going to pick, I did, I did select certain ones that struck me most, but again, I arbitrarily said to myself, I'm only going to do July, so it's not uh, uh, going and picking uh, the, the really, really standouts of the year. Here's a typical thing with the world's needs. July 1st it was this prayer request. Bhutu, and these are all pseudonyms, Bhutu came to Christ in Bangladesh after being raised Buddhist. His wife, now get this, he became a Christian. Get this, his wife took their child and his brothers beat him mercilessly. What did he say? And his own brothers now. He said, they can persecute me, they can even take my life, but I will still follow Jesus. And then an example of it says, pray that others may come to Christ as he stands firm. July 3rd, in Myanmar, former Burma, the concept that to be Burmese is to be Buddhist has led to military forces targeting Christians with violence to uproot and drive them out. Pray the Holy Spirit will protect the seed of faith God placed in believers' hearts and that they will remain true to him. 
July 10th, in Kistaram, India, the police threatened, police threatened believers if they didn't stop gathering at their tiny church. The next day, the church burned down. Police refused to take a report on it. Pray for godly reactions so that the face of Jesus may be seen. July 11th, after seeing Jesus in a dream, Gitika says she was physically healed. Many people in India, this is a positive one, many people in India have experienced special healing that drew them to the Lord. Pray for his power to be poured out on open hearts. July 15th, Martin and his family in Bangladesh live in constant fear. Their Muslim neighbors want their land, and so they attack their house and beat Martin nearly to death. Pray for believers who are disregarded by their community because of the fact that they're a minority. July 17th, Western Hemisphere now, Cuban pastor Arteaga gave sweaters and calendars with Bible verses to prisoners. Afterwards, his home was raided, his electronic devices were confiscated, and he remains under house arrest. Pray for the pastor's comfort and encouragement. July 20th, after, or as two pastors left church in Pakistan, suspected Islamic extremists on motorbikes opened fire. They were just leaving their church. One pastor died. The other was severely wounded. Lift up Pakistani believers today. And I'll close with this one. Five believers traveling to a church seminar in Bangladesh were attacked and brutally beaten for their faith. Now picture this, you're going off to some kind of church convocation or seminar or meeting of some kind, brutally attacked and beaten. They helped each other limp to the seminar, never considering missing it. Pray that their example will strengthen many. Well, I'll tell you, speaking very, very personally, this is not why I do it, but I, I can't tell you how many times when I'll read something like that in the morning, as I say, just that length, you know, th two or three sentences, and I say to myself, Bruce, what are you crabbing about today? I mean, seriously, you know, I got to do this today, I got to go to the store, I, gotta, I mean, think of this, and, and it, it fills me with shame, but how glad I am to be part of a network where you have that kind of courage and faithfulness, a network in the sense that we really are called, and I hope that's, again, the lasting lesson of chapter eight that's gonna really stick with us with the various kinds of examples today. We're called to something so much bigger than ourselves and that we can't always see personally. Any comments or uh, questions before we go into table talk? I think we've all probably had plenty to think of this, but I, I can hardly read some of that stuff without tearing up when I think, you know, and imagine people going to a seminar, wouldn't you say, oh, we better go home, we better go to a hospital. No, they help each other limp to the church seminar, never considering missing it. I mean, just one example that I recall from a few seconds ago. Just think of what people go through. So I thought maybe in our uh, table talk, we might want to reflect on things that uh, maybe struck you today in terms of our relationships with Christians in other places or of other kinds, so to speak, different nationalities, backgrounds, and countries. Have you had any experiences on a mission field or with Christians from other countries that you would like to share? It could be positive or you know, maybe, maybe you've seen some suffering among Christians. Or what principles from this chapter do you follow when it, or want to follow maybe, uh, when it comes to giving of time, talents, and, and, and treasure and so forth? So those and whatever else uh, might enter your mind I think would be important to talk about in these uh, minutes left. So let's do that at this time.
Okay, thank you for batting that one around, and I think we're about ready to go here. Again, next week we'll look at chapters 9 and 10, and I'm glad you can join us on this journey through 2 Corinthians. Let's pray. And Lord, I, I feel the need to, to lift our prayers far and wide in terms of roaming the world right now, and uh, Christians who are meeting under some duress, it wouldn't be exactly this time, of course, but those who meet on the Sabbath and uh, sometimes uh, risk a very harmful injury or even death just for meeting together. But Lord, thank you for their faithfulness. What an example to us. They give to us so much in terms of inspiration and knowing your power. And so I pray for Christian fellowship far away, near at hand, and right here in this very room with the dear people in this room. Lord, thank you for the wonderful body of Christ to which you have called us to belong. Thank you for grace and what grace really means. Move us, touch us by your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit in all of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.